go. Yeah. For this play, this is where we wanted it. Back, looks, throws, and yes. yes. Caught! Touchdown, Detroit Lions! They did it! Let's go! Oh, my goodness! This is Inside the Pride presented by Soaring Eagle Casino and Resort, a weekly 30-minute show airing right here on the Lions TV network. I'm your host, Danny Rogers, and how about week two for the Detroit Lions, ending with a 36-27 win over the Washington Commanders. Back-to-back -back weeks, this Detroit offense put at least 35 points on the scoreboard. This past game, all three phases got in on the scoring. We'll talk through that win with head coach Dan Campbell before we look ahead to those Minnesota Vikings, feature our weekly player interview, and wrap up part two with Lions legend Len Barney. First up though, let's head out to Ford Field to relive the sights and sounds from win number one. Ford Field in downtown Detroit, week two in the National Football League and the Lions are back. Looking for their first victory of the year. The Washington Commanders come in today. Get another home game around this crowd. Going to be the same environment we saw last week. Crowd up and making noise as that Lions defense takes the field for the first time today. This front seven of this defense for the Lions, they need to dominate this game early. Blitz back, blitz comes, dodging traffic. Now he's hit, now he's going down. Has got fire, St. Brown wide open across midfield. Burns gives to Swift, Swift looks for an opening, finds one, there he goes. That's another big run by DeAndre Swift. Throw, went, hit from behind, ball's loose, out of the back of the end zone. That is a safety. Charles Harris got him. So Washington sets up for the free kick. Track deep to take that is Khalif Raymond. Gets to the 30, 35, 40. There he goes, 45, 50. Right sideline. Washington territory. Picking up a block. Taken down at the 30-yard line. The Khalif Raymond with a big return for Detroit. Third and five. There's the snap to golf. Back in the pocket. Rolling right. Being chased. Throws. End zone. Caught. Yes. Touchdown, Detroit Lions. Oh, baby. That is and Ross St. Brown had to go up to get it, and he did it. There's the snap. He's got it, wants to throw. Wentz looks, looks, pressure comes. Wentz hit, sack, back inside the 20. Aiden Hutchinson, that's number two. Goff takes the snap, turns, fakes to Jamal, throws, end zone. It is caught. Touchdown, Detroit Lions. Josh Reynolds again. There's the snap, Wentz has got it, he's back, Blitz comes, Wentz in trouble, yes. gonna go down, guess who? Aiden Hutchinson, that's three on the day for the rookie out of Michigan. <laughs> comes out of there on all fours like a dog and he's playing like a dog. <laughs> Halftime, 22-0, Lions lead it over Washington. It's been a good all-around effort, but there's a lot of football left in this game right now. You got to finish this thing. That's a team that can score quickly over there. They get the ball to start the second half. They can get some momentum back on their side real quick. Washington from the Detroit 15. Wentz leans in, got the football back, looking left, throwing out there, got a man. It is Samuel caught, touchdown. Goff takes the snap, he's back. Goff looks, Goff throws, it is incomplete. Wide of his intended target. But that's the third straight three and out for the Lion offense. Looking, throws, end zone, touchdown, Logan Thomas. It's a seven-point game. You got to get that offense going. Got to find that groove you had earlier in the game. From the 25-yard line. Trickery from the Lions as St. Brown takes it down the sideline. Goff works out of the gun. Goff's back. Washington brings the pressure. Goff throws. It is complete to Swift. Falls down, gets back up and runs inside the 10. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? To the house. Touchdown, Detroit Lions. From the seat of his pants to the end zone. Oh my goodness. 32, I see you. That is something else. First and 10 from the 13 of Washington. 
Goff wants to throw, does left side, caught, touchdown Detroit Lions! The man who just set an NFL record on the Ross St. Brown! That's going to do it. Two teams will meet out in the middle of the field to say job well done, job better done on this day by the Detroit Lions, who pick up their first victory of the year, 36 to 27. A ton of love coming for the offensive line that stepped up against the Commanders. Three starters were out, which meant Evan Brown, Logan Stenberg, and Dan Skipper. Skipper, who after waiting six years, finally got his first start in the NFL, and he took advantage of it. It's back to work, though. The Vikings are on the horizon, and we'll hear what head coach Dan Campbell has to say. But first, we'll introduce you to Detroit Lions cheerleader Kendall C., followed by our weekly player interview. We'll be right back. Inside the Pride is presented by Soaring Eagle Casino and Resort and sponsored by Priority Health, Kroger, and by Henry Ford Health. Salut, comment ça va? Je m'appelle Kendall and this is my first year as a captain for the Detroit Lions cheerleaders. I decided to learn French because I was studying classical ballet and they use a lot of the same terminology. And from there I just found it was interesting and kept going with it. Another language that I would like to learn is American Sign Language. I think it's super important to be able to connect with people from all different backgrounds. This means nice to meet you. I am a fitness instructor and one of my professional goals is to be able to teach a fitness class that's accessible for everyone. So people who may use mobility aids, uh, people of different uh, physical abilities, and that's also why I would love to learn American Sign Language. A couple items on my bucket list would be to travel to as many countries as possible. The first place I'd love to travel would be to go to France or anywhere in Europe. I think the culture is so rich there and they have such beautiful architecture. I'd also love to try a few extreme sports like skydiving and I know this is a little weird, but I would love to luge. Um, it's something that I saw on the Winter Olympics and was inspired to try. If I could meet any celebrity, it would be Noodle the Pug. I I'd love to meet Noodle because both he and his owner are a great example of how cool and impactful it can be to rescue an animal. Wentz pumps that right leg, leans in, there's the snap, he's back in his end zone to throw. Wentz, hit from behind, ball's loose, out of the back of the end zone. That is a safety. Charles Harris got him. The sack fumble for the safety, I felt like was, was the difference in the game. And Charles started that. Charles, week two, you had a sack, two quarterback hits, a forced fumble that resulted in a safety, and that safety was just one of the 52 plays you were involved in. However, head coach Dan Campbell said that made the difference. What opened up that you were able to get to the quarterback and force that ball loose? Yeah, just everybody playing complimentary football uh, on the back end, you know, to the linebackers, to uh, the other guys beside me. Everybody playing complimentary football and did a great job in coverage, and um, we knew it was gonna have to pass the ball in the situation. I got a one-on-one -on -one matchup and just took advantage of it. Fellow defensive lineman Aiden Hutchinson says, getting sacks on QBs is tedious. What makes it tedious? Uh, they can be slippery sometimes, uh, especially against the guy we played against last week. Uh, they can be slippery. Um, getting sacks in the NFL is, is a lot more complicated than people think. You know, um, you know, being able to scheme up against guys on third down, uh, even second down along, things like that. Um, knowing the right scheme and knowing the right protections. And uh, also knowing the right move that you're going to do against that in individual uh, in that time, place, and moment. Um, but yeah, he's learning his way. I think he got a great, great experience this past weekend. And um, yeah, nah, he's, he's got a lot more to come. This time last year, week two started a four-week span. You were able to get to the quarterback four times in a row, four sacks. Knowing you've done it once, how can you continue that tedious work here now? Uh, really just staying on the top of my keys, you know, going into each week the same way I do every week and uh, make sure I'm standing on my details, uh, following my routine, uh, my habits, and uh, just doing the right thing day in and day out, putting them as, work, as much work as I can in every day. And it's not something I ever thought about. You know, I didn't know that that statistic was even a thing uh, until last year. Um, but just really just, you know, standing on my P's and Q's and just making sure I'm handling my details. You told me in preseason you, you picked up an off-season hobby a martial art called Wing Chun, where the goal is to end a fight within three seconds of it starting. How has that hobby, that very unique hobby, helped you out on the field this season? Yeah, I mean, just hands, um, hands are coordination. I'll be able to see things before they actually happen. Um, and anticipation, that's the biggest thing, anticipation. And just knowing what's coming next before it actually comes. I think that's where it definitely helped me. And um, on and off the field, it helps me a lot, you know. 
I know this team is anticipating the Minnesota Vikings. They are on the clock, a very familiar NFC North foe. What comes to mind first when you think of Kirk Cousins and that offense? Um, just skill, you know, a lot of skill power. Um, obviously running back power as well. Um, a lot of weapons, you know, we have to eliminate and um, just making sure we're doing our job and to take care of key guys that we know are going to be a problem and, um, and just honing in on the quarterback. All throughout training camp, we saw, I saw two little girls following you around, which is different here in, in year six. The Harris family was able to welcome baby girl number two this past, this past summer. How has the, routine, the routine changed now here in year six with two babies? It's all still the same, just a lot less sleep, you know, that's it, just a lot less sleep. But uh, no, my wife is honestly amazing. Um, she does a great job of carrying a load, you know, in regards to me being here at work, you know, most of the time. And um, I wouldn't be able to do it without her. And I think that's really, that's really what it is. Just her, her special ability to step up to the plate and uh, just take care of all the things at home is uh, it's amazing. So. Mm -hmm. Your first baby girl, does she see dad as this mean, aggressive football player? Nah, she doesn't. Nah, 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 she doesn't. It's funny because this past weekend, my wife told me that um, she was going to the stadium. She was like, she already knew what was going on. Like, when she woke up that morning, she already knew, like, it was game day Sunday. So, going to the stadium, she's like, dad, 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 like, you know, so she's getting used to coming in on Sundays and coming to Ford Field and just, you know, hear, seeing the ambiance, just hearing the hoorahs all day. Welcome back to Inside the Pride. Now join alongside the head coach, Dan Campbell. Coach, I've heard you say so many times that growth for players happens from year one to year two the most. Let's break it down further, week one to week two. How much growth did you see out of your team in that week two win? A lot. Uh, it was one of the things we talked about, playing with detail and discipline. We were in a race to improve. We had to improve faster than Washington, and we did that. And now we have to improve even faster than, than Minnesota in week three. Mm -hmm. Minnesota on the clock. They've got a new head coach in Kevin O'Connell, all new coordinators. How different do they look this year? Uh, they look different. Uh, they do. Now, they still have got uh, all the all the all holdover players with a couple of additions uh, that are good players. Um, but there's a couple of things schematically, offensively, defensively, even special teams that are different. Offensively, let's get to it. Running back Dalvin Cook, when he gets going, he can get going. Only 62 rushing yards Monday Night Football versus Philly for the entire team. Uh, but why does Dalvin Cook lead this team in rushing? Why do you have to be on the lookout for him? Yeah, well, look, he's – because, really, he's suited to run any type of scheme that you want to run. Uh, I mean, here they're in heavy with two back, but you can see this. This, If you give him a chance to get through the line of scrimmage, the rest is up to him, and he is extremely dangerous. So he can run zone, he can run gap, he can do it all, and he can run over you, he can run by you, and he can finish with speed down the field. Uh, I think he's the key to this game defensively for us. We have to stop him. Another emphasis has to be wide receiver Justin Jefferson. Only 48 receiving yards Monday. He's going to be playing mad along with Delvin Cook. Why is Jefferson one of the best receivers in this league? Think about what you just said, only 48 yards. I mean, it's not like that's a bad day, but relative to his standards, the type of player, I know they want more. I know the coach is going to find him, highlight him. Cousins is going to look for him. And uh, it's what they did week one with him. They did a real good job of moving him around and putting him in different positions. And look, it doesn't matter. Wherever they put him, they're going to try to find a way to get him the ball. That's why they're putting him there. So here he goes, man. He's going to climb on the safety, double move. He's got the speed, flat-footed safety backside, and now the rest is up to Cousins. Give him a chance to make a play. He does. And, uh, and man, that's an explosive play. So, listen, Dalvin Cook starts with him, and then we gotta we have to have an answer for this guy at all times. We can't just leave him singled up and because uh, Cousins will find him. Moving to the other side of the ball, uh, Minnesota defense, three sacks Monday night, one of them going to Daniil Hunter. He missed a lot of time last season with a pectoral injury, 10 games he didn't see action in. It doesn't look like he missed any time. What are you seeing from him on, on tape? Yeah, look, Hunter, I think the, the only time he's not effective is when he's not on the field. Uh, because when he's out there, he's highly productive. And he, he's not only good in the pass, you can see that he's good against the run, too. I think he's a pretty good run player. He plays with length. This is a good look at his rush. He does have a quick first step. He's got length, and he's got explosive power. And then he knows how to finish on the cue. This is a good look at it, man. Um, they're going to close the pocket. Those guys there in the middle, you got 55, 94, and, and you got him and 98 on the edge, man. They can, they can make your day pretty long. Heading onto the road for your first road game, all three phases showed up in week two. How important will that be, especially in that atmosphere the Vikings have? Yeah, it's very important. And I think, look, we're, this will be the same old song and dance for us every week. We have to have all three units show up. Uh, that's just where we're at. And so we need them. And as long as all three of them do show up, we got a pretty good chance. And 
Our commun communication offensively has got to be on point. Defensively, we cannot let Dalvin Cook hurt us early. We cannot, because I think that's the key to everything else. Coming up next on Inside the Pride, part two of our sit down with number 20, the seven time Pro Bowler and member of Detroit's Pride of the Lions, Len Barney. He's got the ball, but he's pulled out, and quickly by Lem Barney. He's been a valuable guy for Detroit for so many years. Lem's last season was 1977, and one of the columnists uh, here in Detroit asked him if he could come over and talk to him about being out of football. What was Lem Barney doing? He was watching the Detroit Lions, and he was reacting to every play. He was still a Detroit Lion, and he remained one throughout his life after football. Participated in numerous functions involved with the Detroit Lions and fans. This is Lem Barney. Hello. 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 I'm doing well, good. I'm in uh, sixth grade. Make sure you get those books. All right. You could always count on Lem. Just a wonderful, warm guy in every possible way. Comes time to honor your Detroit Lions NFL 100 all-time team, the original number 20 Pro Football Hall of Famer, Lem You know, from start to finish, you know, there was there was something special and something different about Lem Barney, and uh, we were blessed to have him here in Detroit for from 1967 on. I gave the game everything I had, anything that I could do to help win, I was willing to do. And uh, the skills that the Lord had blessed me with, I didn't leave the game by saying I did not use them. Everything I had, I gave while I was on the field. Ladies and gentlemen, no one I've ever coached is more deserving of this high honor than this man. Players of his kind come around once in a lifetime. Limb warning. Today, you share this moment with me. To my teammates, thank you for your encouragement, for your support, for your motivation. Football for me for 20 years was a way of life. I enjoyed it, and every opportunity I had, I tried to promote victories and wins. I thank you very much, God bless you, and I love you. A second round draft pick to the Detroit Lions in 1967, Lem Barney would go on to become the NFL Defensive Rookie of the Year with his 10 interceptions that led the league, add seven-time Pro Bowler to his resume, and his jersey, number 20, would be retired at Ford Field. A wonderful tribute for a legendary Detroit Lion. Inside the Pride is taking a break. Up next, Rogers retweets. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside the Pride. Before we wrap up today's show, we have got to get to everybody's favorite new segment called Rogers Retweets. It's where I'm pulling my favorite social media posts from this past week. And first up, we are introducing you to a very special little guy, Hudson Ghazi. He is a Plymouth native, the same hometown that defensive lineman Aiden Hutchinson is from. And Hutch dedicated Sunday's game against the Commanders to little Hudson, who was diagnosed with leukemia. Hutch would go on to have three sacks in that game. And you can check out Hudson Ford Tough pages on Instagram and Facebook for ways you can support the Ghazi family. Hudson, the Lions family is thinking about you. All right, up next, this is a first timer at the Detroit Lions game and what a win this little one was able to see. Jay Rich, a big fan of J-Mo, we appreciate that. Check out this little guy, Norma Senton, number 97. That's what he's got on his jersey. It kind of looks like a baby hutch. We love this one. And last but not least, Detroit Lions social media team did some trolling Monday. And all I can say is head to the comment section of this tweet, Detroit Lions at Lions on Twitter, for all the context you'll ever need. That's a wrap on Rogers retweets this week. If you want to be featured in this segment, just hashtag Rogers retweets, and I'll be sure that I find you. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Inside the Pride. A reminder, Detroit Lions are on the road for week three. They're heading out to Minnesota to take on their first NFC North opponent this season. Kickoff is scheduled for 1 p.m. Thanks so much for tuning into Inside the Pride. We'll see you next week.